and afterwards they set off on their way and dropped in for the other Tsarevnas, and they all came to their homeland together. The Tsar was really overjoyed, opened up the royal treasury for them, and said, Well, my trusted servants, take as much as you need. Take some money for your labor. Frolka was quick. He brought his big three-cornered hat. The soldier brought his knapsack, and the Revna they carried in an egg basket. Frolka was the first one to pour. He poured and poured, and the hat broke, and the silver went into the mud. Frolka started in again. He poured, and it overflowed the hat. There's nothing to be done, said Frolka. Clearly, the entire royal treasury will go to me. And what will we get, his companions asked him. The Tsar will get enough for you, too. Aremna, while there was still money, filled his basket, and the soldier his knapsack, and then they all went home. And Frolka, with his hat, stayed right by that royal treasury, and is still sitting there, pouring it in. When he fills that hat, then I'll go on with the tale. But now I've got no more strength or will. Oh, hello! I didn't see you there. My name is Ian, and today we are talking about Vladimir Propp's The Life of the Folktale. Propp is one of the most important folktale scholars of the 20th century. His major work is the morphology of the folktale, where basically he was taking a set of, uh, a set of narratives, a large collection of um, of uh, ATU numbers, 300 to 749. They were, they were armed numbers at the time. And uh, see, well, what is the, is there like a basic, basic structure to absolutely every tale? And that book was very influential. It was influential in North American folklore when it finally became translated in the mid 1960s. Um, this is from uh, a collection that was going to be sort of his. Uh, his masterwork, his life's work on, on the fairy tale based on a series of lectures done in the late 1960s. He died before it was published. Uh, and it was only very recently that through notes from his students, through new translation, it was finally made available in English. And uh, this is the final chapter in that, the life of the folktale. Sort of a um, having uh, talked about the nature of tale and, and, ver and the nature of particular tales within it, he takes sort of a step back. I really, really like this reading, and I think it's important. Uh, he was pointing out that the Russian approach had been to identify with tellers, and they were probably the first internationally to actually pay attention to who was talking, because they were moving away from that idea of the performance is something that um, you would work through in order to discern what the actual text was. He said, no, let's, let's look at the tellers. And started to do things like label, their, uh, label the teller and the region in their collections. And then subsequently start arranging collections not by tale type, uh, not by theme, but by, uh, but by teller. So imagine an interesting analogy would be like an art museum, for example. You can uh, arrange, you could organize a museum by oils and watercolors and pastels and then sort of, you know, more concrete arts like statuary and, and so on. You could do that. You could organize by uh, century. Um, so you could do a chronological ordering, which is also useful. You could, you could uh, analyze by theme. You could have landscapes, portraits, family life, still life. Um, or you can organize by artist. And uh, organizing by artist, uh, the, all of them are valid, but by organizing by artist, you are starting to think about the nature of being an artist as much as you are about the nature of what is depicted in art. And when. So they changed, uh, almost by accident, they changed the approach. And they wanted to really pay attention to who was telling them what the region was. And um, because they started to notice that individual tellers began, uh, individual tellers had certain stylistic uh, contributions. Um, and, uh, and one of the things is that that brought to the, the fore, 
that ongoing tension that exists in all studies of all folklore, basically, that tension between the continuity, which is implied in the collective, and uh, variation, which occurs when the individual takes the sense of the continuous and makes it individually concrete. And so, um, but it's not a it's not a strict binary in terms of opposition, or rather, as he points out, the shift from looking at the text to tellers can't really end there. The idea of sort of moving away from the tradition to the individual um, isn't a isn't a single turn. It really needs to begin to articulate how the individual and the and the collective how the type such as it is and the individual version how the uh, conservative and the dynamic how they are always present and always in some sort of tension and always in, and that tension is a creative tension that tension is not oppositional it's it's complementary and he's beginning to articulate these ideas these ideas were uh, beginning to percolate into the north american system as well and it would be interesting because he was in the soviet union at the time and although his early work had had entered into north america some of his uh, later work had yet to do so because of the language barrier because of, of sort of institutional academic barriers so i don't know how much Prop's work in this particular decade, in the 1960s, was permeating the American thought in the 1960s. But I believe that if there wasn't necessarily explicit influence and crossover, they were coming to the same conclusion at more or less the same time. That there has to be some reconciliation uh, when you turn to the individual performer. Um, so... One of the things that he's answering, because there's, there's a, uh, you don't want to focus, although you, you, you need exemplary performers, because you need the idea of thinking of tales as coming through tellers, and exemplary performers with a reputation for competency and a reputation for breadth uh, are good people to collect from. Uh, they cannot be the sole uh, answers, uh, because uh, they, they cannot be the, the end of, the, of the, the inquiry. His solution was basically collect everything from everybody. I mean, he's very aware that that is an impossibility, but if you are widespread in your collection, so you're not simply collecting from people with a, uh, with a reputation for competency, but you also have, you're collecting from people who uh, do not have that performative uh, reputation, some people who might tell terrible stories. It is a consequence of the, the context of collecting, uh, doubly so when we are looking for exemplary texts, that we only choose exemplary performances. If someone has a bad night, we don't even take that recording. But we can learn something from bad performances. We can learn something from failure. We can learn something from how a text doesn't succeed. And there are some really interesting dynamics uh, where, uh, when, and we find that ethnographically every now and then, when we come across these descriptions of bad performances. And in the, in the past couple of years, people are more and more interested in failure uh, in performance and what that means. What it means for jokes to fail, what it means for a story to not be appreciated, because what Prop is doing, even if he isn't saying so, but what's happening is what makes a bad performance? Is it's, I mean, you can imagine someone forgets. Well, that's okay. Uh, that will happen. But a bad performance can also be, it was not receptive. It did not meet audience expectations. And so competency is only half of it. Uh, competency or facility with a text is only half of it. The other half is um, whether that 
competency and facility with the text is meeting the expectations of the specific audience context that is being uh, addressed at that particular moment in time. So Prop, by, by collecting everything, um, he's really sort of motivated towards an understanding of, of, um, of audience because, as the title suggests, he's interested in the life of the folktale. He's interested in the biosphere, as it were, of the folktale. He's interested in the environment that gives the folktale existence. Uh, the, the mechanisms that allow this thing, which doesn't exist outside of beings, but at least metaphorically, to exist through the inhalation and the exhalation of performance and reception and how it is understood. And then, you know, because when you want to, when you want, when you do want to move away from thinking of it purely as a series of messages to, well, it seems to have some kind of existence outside of its original, outside of its individual performances. How do you, you know, what, what does that mean? What does the very nature of folktale existing as, if not necessarily a thing, then as a, a, a collective desire for that thing to be? Oh, that's good. Write that down. Uh, which is really all a genre is, which is really all a tradition is. It's something that the group has decided we are going to continue to give this life. It doesn't exist without the group giving it life, but we are going to, we are going to imbue it with life in the same way that a corporation is a human being for legal purposes. Uh, texts or versions or fairy tales exist because we imbue view it with the idea that it is a lie. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad I'm getting this on tape. So he wants to talk about the forms and functions of the folktale. So, you know, to what purpose is it placed? And um, it might be good to think of when he's talking about functions to be thinking of it in the same way that William Baskin in his storytelling, uh, Toward an Understanding of Storytelling Events uh, reading, he distinguishes between uses and functions. And he is talking about how functions are um, discerned by analysis. And they are intelligent hypotheses, but they are based on theory. So that the function of a tale, if your approach is um, uh, feminism, is to potentially reinforce uh, patriarchal norms and to reinforce gender roles and gender standards within an oppressive culture. If you are looking at it through a capitalist, um, or through a Marxist fra uh, framework, you might be thinking of it in terms of um, uh, substantiating the hegemon and, and you know, emphasizing, um, emphasizing the uh, manifest destiny, the accrual of capital as sort of an ultimate good. Uh, again, sort of, you know, a hegemonic enterprise. Uh, and those are the functions, they're discerned, like, oh, well, this, so in a way, with the, with the group doesn't understand why they tell the tales. Uh, and then, uh, use. And again, Bascom isn't saying that the group doesn't understand. Bascom is saying that often the general approach of coming up with functions for these tales is this kind of snootiness that the group doesn't understand what, why exactly they're telling the tales. Oh, you don't understand the real purpose. And that's like the, the, um, the great shame of many theoretical approaches is that I know what you're doing, but you, the simple folk, do not. Um, Bascom uses uses to say about how the group understands, how the, the culture in which these, these, these uh, uh, storytelling events occur, how they understand uh, the, the use of them, what they are for. And I think use might be a better term than function here. How they are, um, uh, how they are employed. And you might be able to get a, a uh, at the very least, you might be able to then start to um, uh, balance between, or how, the, how there's a feedback mechanism between uh, the understood purpose, the understood use of not simply the tale, but the telling of the tale, uh, and, uh, and what gets told in that particular instance. And certainly, I mean, a very clean cut example of that is to tell a tale that, um, 
uh, on certain occasions to tell a lesson, uh, to teach a lesson, it, you all, you're going to have a much more pedagogically informed tale than uh, than as some kind of entertainment. And then, yeah, that's how uh, our mere entertainment. Uh, he also wants to posit that at one time, perhaps, and there are hints of it, that there were ritual aspects, and he's speaking in the Russian context, that there are ritual aspects to folktale. You get hints through the narrative tradition through, through, and through what is being collected in texts that there were certain tales that were forbidden to tell at certain times, uh, whether times of day or times of year. And that's been noted by other anthropologists in other contexts, and that might, that might be the case. And it is still the case in, in, in many cultures that there are tales that are only told at night or tales that are only told at winter or, or, or so on. And uh, he, so that, that there is a ritualistic function that has to do with some kind of sacrality um, that might be in place for folktale, but it didn't exist, at least it, that ritual aspect with a capital R didn't exist within the Russian context at the time of sort of mid 19th century onwards. Those, the, that was not uh, caught, that was not sort of seen as one of the uses. So, uh, whereas one can postulate and accept as a working hypothesis that that was it at one time, uh, it's good to go forward, always trying to recognize whether those actual um, uh, uses were, uh, ritual uses were in place, or whether the uses had sort of changed now about it. Um, yeah. But because one of the things to consider with the idea of tale being a form of an almost ritualistic form is the idea of the storyteller almost having sacral powers. And I think that uh, there, there is something, again, a holdover. I don't want to say a remnant. I don't want to say residual. I don't want to use those uh, categories because those are sort of dangerous folkloristic terms. But I think there is some like ongoing resonance about how we understand storytelling. It's really interesting when you talk about the psychology of storytelling, or at least the, the present day psychology of storytelling, how it does often imbue itself with, with um, uh, mythic properties. And, um, and certainly we talk about storytelling in therapy, and we talk about storytelling in a whole host of different contexts where the act of narration is uh, uh, seen as transformative uh, but almost in like a deep re-hardwiring one's, one's, uh, uh, one's uh, neural pathways kind of way. Uh, and, and, and at the very least, the storyteller has, has an esteem that seems to be something almost of a different order than uh, exemplary talent in other fields. I'm going to leave it at that, but it's an interesting holdover. Do we consider storytelling kind of magical? And certainly, like the the, the, the featured, prominent, uh, established, reputational storytellers, uh, in addition to the, the the general act. One of the things of trying to figure out what uh, is the uh, um, what are, the, what are tales uses, how do we understand tale, is to actually figure out who tells them, you know, in what purpose uh, do we find them. And one of the things that, that's really kind of intriguing is he uh, noticed, and he wasn't the first to notice, but again, he's sort of creating this you know, sort of master summary, is how many, how much storytelling is in, um, associated with work and that itinerant uh, workers or people who are brought into the house are often um, exemplary workers. If they're doing something that allows for the human voice to still be uh, heard and allows for audiences, um, those people often will have some kind of uh, you know, storytelling capability. So, um, uh, you know, so people who are again itinerant, invited into homes, uh, is the, there's a remarkable amount of. Uh, 
of, a, of t the storytelling uh, reputation there, in part probably because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of storytelling practice. It is a way to accompany labor. Um, one of the key areas is during times of idleness at work camps. So again, storytelling. You know, if things like uh, the lumber camps or at sea, uh, there are times when the labor does not allow for storytelling because you are exerting yourself in that way. But you also have these uh, remarkable periods of rest. Uh, Sandy Ives has this incredibly important article about the two traditions. And Sandy Ives was a uh, folklorist based in Maine, but did all of Atlantic Canada. Um, uh, did a lot of work in, in New Brunswick and PEI in addition to Maine because he sort of saw it as a large region and certainly kind of um, an ecozone, as it were, but an oikozone of, uh, of uh, cultural exchange. It really wasn't until like the mid 20th century and kind of a, a reinforcement of the border uh, as sort of more sacrosanct that the itinerancy didn't happen as much. But um, he studied the, main, the, uh, the woods of Maine and the woods of New Brunswick and uh, how lumber camps became these incredibly important nodes for how stories moved from community to community, how song, particularly, his area is more song than story, but how um, folklore um, repertoires shifted from community to community and they're through the lumber camps because people would come from all over Atlantic Canada Men would come from all over Atlantic Canada. They would spend time in the camps. They would work in the day and then uh, in the evenings or perhaps on Sundays when there wasn't work, there was just idleness. They, you know, they would engage in, in cultural performances. And there was a value that was placed on having a distinct repertoire. And there was a status accorded to you know, performance competency. And so they would be performing the stories from their own communities. Uh, the, I keep on using story. Ives talks about song, but the same premise is in place. If you use the songs from their own communities, uh, they would uh, uh, perform them there. That would be their repertoire, but then they would gather, you know, they'd also be audience, and then they would go back to their home communities, and then there they would have, um, they would bring these new songs and, and, and bring them back, back home. So in sort of early social network theory, a song could be composed in one community, um, enter into uh, the sort of node of the lumber camp, and then spread right across Atlantic Canada by the next uh, sort of like you know the next summer or the next you know um, uh, period between uh, after the logging season. And so uh, the, these work camps are, are an incredibly important place. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Ives Two tradition ever so briefly because. That is about the tradition, and that explains, explains two things. It explains sort of the breadth of repertoire that someone might have because there is a, repu there's a desire to establish that reputation. And when men come back to their, their communities, they have the entire lumber camp community repertoire to draw from when they're, when they're sort of back home, as it were. And there's also, of course, status and... and uh, uh, I don't know if I need to come up with a second word. There's status according good performance in those situations where people are otherwise idle. So, uh, and it's public. So, you know, there's, there's almost a competitive aspect to it. If not necessarily actual competition, then, you know, who is the best storyteller? Who do we want to hear from? And so on. Women's labor doesn't rest in the same way that men's labor does. Men's labor can be, of course, incredibly uh, intense, but when it is done, because it is often done outside the home, it's often done, you know, either very far away in terms of actual out-migrant labor, um, or, you know, in fields and forests and so on, um, on, on the sea, um, yeah, but it can only be done in that particular place. When women's labor is so focused, traditionally, so focused on the domestic sphere and their responsibilities that it never really ends. And they're also typically women are not in public crowds in the same way and crowds that are jockeying for status in the same way that, that men's performance contexts are. So when women perform, they're often performing while doing other tasks like child rearing like cleaning and so on, Spe again, spe especially with song, 
less so with story, although we are seeing in prop examples of this. So women's repertoire tends to be narrower because she's not jockeying for a position in the same way that a, men, that a men's tradition is. But it's also sort of more time depth because rather than trying to work for uh, the breadth of the performance, it's a few, a few ones that have been passed down through a much more narrow chain. And so if you're looking for the older forms, uh, you, you often, you, you can find them among uh, women. They will have, like basically they are repeating the, the, uh, the repertoire of their, of their mothers while men are constantly trying to bring new, new repertoires in. So it's broad and thin as opposed to narrow and deep. And that's sort of true, the two traditions very briefly discuss the two, two traditions idea. But it's important to think of because we want to remember that these narratives arrive in context. Ives was talking about the spread of them. Um, and Prop is probably implicitly talking about the spread of them. He's certainly sort of talking about, you know, how, uh, in what context would these perform? Where do these performers, these star performers that he starts, um, he starts uh, enumerating, where do they emerge from? Now, of course, he is enumerating these star performers despite having just said that uh, the star performer is not necessarily a useful uh, diagnostic tool, but really, it's, it's a useful diagnostic tool, it just can't be the only one, because we're only going to be, see the exemplary, we're only going to see the, one, the narratives that have lain, been laid claim to, in a way, by particular performers, and, and, uh, and so on. So, um, he does ask whether it's possible to, to actually then, you know, if you can identify performers, good performers, indifferent performers, can you start to type them? Um, and again, it's that sort of desire to um, categorize, to assort, uh, because once we can assort, that helps us look for, for greater patterns. And fundamentally, he leaves that as a maybe. Uh, uh, basically, that we probably could start to do that, but we need to do the let's collect everything. Again, a sloppy analogy, but one that might work. You can't really start figuring out phyla and kingdom and species and all that stuff until you've got like a critical mass of animals. You can't just take like a bear and a cat and a snake and say, all right, well, these are the three kinds of animals. You need to look for patterns of recognition until you can finally throw in, yeah, dolphins and mammal. I know, don't make sense, but here's why. You're like, okay, dolphins, mammal. What's the thing that isn't a bear? You know, pandas, not bears. Still get confused by that. Um, because science. So he does have a couple of sort of like, you know, randomly, uh, uh, some random observations in that, uh, because he is trying to, he's writing in the late 60s. He's writing when the, there were still clearly within the depths of the Soviet Union. They were post-Stalinist. They were past the time, well, more past the time, when folklore studies, and but really the idea of the presentation of folk materials was influenced by politics of the, of the state. It was still present to a certain extent, and in the same way that it's, it's going to be present in liberal democracies, it's going to be present everywhere. I mean, what we study is going to be at least partly informed by, um, you know, we had greater liberties, but, you know, partly informed by the political context in which we're studying them. And when we study Canadian folklore, uh, there's a certain Canadian nationalism that is sometimes hoped for, not necessarily implied. I digress. Uh, but, you know, in, during certainly the Stalinist era, there was great misuse of folktale and the, the rewriting of folktale, the re-presentation of folktale with the idea that these narratives that the folktale are inherently, almost like the natural state, if not of culture, if not of man, 
than at least of the Russian peoples and the Soviet peoples is towards socialism, is towards a you know, collective brotherhood, towards the uh, overcoming of, of the capital and so on. And, um, and how tales were occasionally co-opted or corrupted in order to um, uh, illustrate that purpose, uh, il illustrate some kind of, uh, or justify from the roots up, some kind of um, inherent political character of the people. And so, of course, this is the natural, of course, the, the Soviet enterprise is a natural state of being. The very folk, the, the unlettered, this would be their natural state, were, had it not been for centuries of aristocratic oppression. So, um, by the time Prop is writing this, uh, that era is, has at least been critiqued and at least has been moved past. Probably not forever, probably not entirely erased, but moved past. And so he needs to start making these observations and that when you are, and the Tsar is a good example because the Tsar, the, the aristocracy, the, uh, the uh, oppressive uh, feudal system was the great thing that was overthrown. And it was then, it was then overthrown in favor of a, of a, you know, a Marxist and really a Lenin Stalinist uh, dictatorship, but it was overthrown as an oppressive thing. So what happens with all the fairy tales, uh, the folk tales that still have czars in them? Are they uh, pre-revolutionary? Are, are, are they inherently something that is, um, uh, are, are they a holdover from the decadent time? Should they be expunged? Or, you know, what, but is it okay when the czar is, is overcome? You know, what, what's the metaphorical role of the Tsar? And the issue is that, well, these fairy tale, again, and, and I think this is Prop's basic idea, or one of his ideas, is that fairy tale is less about a reflection of culture, per se, um, as it is a, a, um, a form of entertainment that, uh, and a form of uh, storytelling that has a regular and anticipatable trajectory tra trajectory towards it. They are formulaic because they are about people from particular circumstances um, being emancipated from those circumstances. But then you have to drape culture over them because you have an audience that lives in a particular context. And so the czar, remember people aspiring to become the czar or people being rewarded by becoming czar, uh, or, 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 or uh, rewarded with riches and so on. It isn't necessarily about uh, the feudal system in, arist in the aristocracy. It isn't necessarily about capitalism. It's about, well, that becomes a symbol of earthly reward. Um, so he says sometimes, you know, the, the czar is, is you know, it could be anything. It just happens to be the czar. And it is the, the forest of symbols. It is the, the, the repertoire of motifs that um, uh, this, particular Rush, this particular tale is uh, uh, associated with because such is the nature of, um, because, it, because it takes place in Russia. Because it takes place in Russia, it's going to have it. So, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. so the Tsar is the richest, the most powerful, the most independent patriarchy, and inevitably sire the most beautiful daughters. Uh, so the Tsar enjoys freedoms that we do not that we do not have. The, the Tsar is a symbol not of power so much as of independence, the ultimate independence. It is good to be the king, as Mel Brooks reminds us. And so, therefore, um, the aristocracy, you know, it's it's not it doesn't have that function. Going back, it doesn't have that function of reaffirming the value of particular forms of governance. It functions as a symbol. It, don't want to use function to, to uh, confuse you. It, it acts as a symbol of ultimate independence. Everyone wants to be the king, not because they crave feudal power. It's because they want to not be beholden to anyone. 
the folk tale is all about moving from being beholden to parents to uh, to, to the wealthy uh, to being your own person to being your own person to being your, your, your own uh, scion of a, of, a, of a new clan um, so individual stylists have individual styles some are very or at least aspire to be very faithful some are very uh, free and and uh, act at liberty in order to, to play around with with the with, uh, with tail and he wonders whether that also constitutes a type uh, whether we should perhaps distinguish between tellers who are conservative and tellers who are who are dynamic that might be a useful way but we need to sort of figure out the, the implications of that but he's sort of generating patterns uh, and he likes this idea of uh, because we have, because we can demonstrate that there is a desire for conservatism, and because we can demonstrate that there is a desire for dynamism, and that we can demonstrate that nevertheless, despite both of these desires, as an organic system, the, uh, it's, it still perpetuates. Neither seems to be putting either at risk. Um, that must be indicative of something. Now, as I was just saying, uh, despite the fact that the evidence of the Tsar and the evidence of particular symbols from a pre-revolutionary past do not necessarily mean that they are uh, that they are beholden to that pre-revolutionary past, does not necessarily mean that they are um, uh, reactionary. What they can mean, what it can imply is that there is um, that they can be repurposed you can take these tales you can shift them around because they are fluid the question is um is that necessarily the case is a folk tale inherently some form of uh some form of uh, uh apology for for the state um but one does need to be careful that, that you can you can, you can, well, I don't know if you need to be careful. It really depends, of course, on your political ideology. But the thing is that, that the, since there is a structure there, um, and it is a framework, it's a framework of anticipation. A genre is just a set of, a genre is just a set of um, anticipated forms, and a type is a, is a set of anticipated content. In which, you know, both of which can be employed at any given performance, uh, so that the audience knows and doesn't know what's going to happen. They know because they have certain expectations of form. They know because they have certain expectations of content, whether on the level of, of type or whether on the con on the level of genre. But they don't know in terms of what the performer is actually going to do with it. Are they going to be um, conservative, dynamic, are they going to be radical, are they going to be postmodern? Um, we can see how, uh, we, 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 this is my point. The study of folk literature is always going to be retrospective because that's the way time works. But if we look at what happened in the past, not as benchmarks, not as standards, not as the places where it was done well, or it was done better, and even where it was done first, but a series of examples of how it has been done, we can think of um, the trajectory of the study of folk, of folk literature as thinking of in the when we shift ourselves into the position of audience, folklore is audience focused. We shift ourselves into, into the, uh, the position of audience. And so 
when I sit down at a uh, in any you know storytelling event in any performance context as an audience member and I not as internationally renowned folklorist Ian Brody but as uh, a person I'm bringing with me the vernacular equivalent of an understanding of, of uh, genre form and I'm bringing with me the vernacular equivalent of an understanding of types and content and I'm now going to see how it's employed in this particular instance and my criteria for evaluating and providing the feedback that brings about that uh, that uh, new thing is about moving forward yeah that's it it's about what comes next study of folklore study of folk literature it's about trying to understand what comes next we do that through the analysis of how the what comes next was enacted in the past and all we have is the recording of that thing unless we have the benefit of actually doing the ethnographic moment and, and the recording of that thing was often indelicate, so sometimes our conclusions are clumsy because of the data that we are drawing from. But we need to think of it, think of it as anticipatory. I don't think prop was there at, yet, uh, but I think, he, I think he was thinking of it as a living thing. And if you're thinking of it as a living thing, and using his life of the folktale, and if you want to use that analogy of that, you know, it doesn't have actual organic reality, but, it, but we, we treat it as it does. We need to think of the biosphere in which it operates. We are thinking of its survival. And so we are thinking of it going forward. This has been fun. Okay. It went... I don't think this went astray at all. This is what happens in that as one is, the, the, the reason why people teach, fundamentally, at least the reason why I teach, is uh, within a classroom setting, and this is, functions as one at least, is to articulate ideas. So I'm trying to take something and synthesize it. Uh, in that act of synthesis, I have insights and if, if I'm trying to synthesize it out loud in, in, to someone um, I might have insights into it and you just might happen to be in the way when it happens but this is fun I'm gonna stop now because you've got stuff to do and I've got stuff to do and I've got stuff to think about now so this was uh, Vladimir Prop's life of the folktale um, as ever, I bid you well, my friends. <laughs>